Yeah, 20 and two reds, over 20. Three greens, over 40. 25 gray. This looks like last year's attack. 20 red, 15 green, 15 green. This tree's gonna die. Last year's attack, it should be red by next year. It's the, rather heavily stained. The attack must be a couple years old. There's a beetle. And it's still alive. Yeah, you can have a good look at it there. forests of British Columbia's East Kootenai Mountains. Nice country, but today it's a disaster area. Hundreds of thousands of the lodgepole pine are being eaten to death. Those red trees are already dead. And who knows how many of the green ones are dying. The killer is a bug, less than a centimeter long, the mountain pine beetle. And who's ever heard of the mountain pine beetle? Hello? Do you know what this is? No, I have no idea. What does it look like to you? Locust. No. Cockroach? No. It looks like a large chocolate with legs on it. It looks like a beetle. That's right, it's a beetle. It's called the mountain pine beetle. It's from the interior of BC and it's eating our timber. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I see one, I'll step on it. <laughs> Thanks, okay, thank you. Well, some kind of a beetle. Looks like beetle. That's right. Have you ever heard of the mountain pine beetle? Not really. Most people have never heard of this guy. An insect that's destroying hundreds of thousands of the large pole pine in the interior of this province. Well, they've sure heard of that guy in Cranbrook. For the logging companies here, the mountain pine beetle epidemic is a disaster they have to cope with. And people like Bob Rualt and Art Youngman have to plan for. Well, Art, the situation up here right now is that uh, we just finished our study last week here, and uh, Upper Kootenai PSYU pine, there's about 150,000 acres of pine. And in that, there's about uh, 400,000 units that are in the epidemic stage right now. And uh, as you know, most of the epidemic is in the uh, Elk Creek area mm -hmm. and the White, White River drainage system in the lower part towards the Kootenai River area. That's the current situation. We've got green attack up there, which is one or two trees attacked in pine stands. And if the situation continues, we're looking at about four million units of wood in the whole, uh, lower part of the upper Kootenai PSYU. How long do you think it would take at the present rate to affect that total volume of four, four million units? To wipe out, if, it's, if things went the way they are, I'd say up to eight years. It's gone beyond uh, current level of uh, harvesting, uh, some kind of drastic moves have to be made because it's going to change the whole wood supply down the road for us. So what we're trying to do is get as much beetle killed into the mills as possible and uh, salvage, the most salvage as much as we possibly can. And get the best return dollar out of this wood before it's gray attacked and dead, which exactly as right. you know in the mill yeah. is no darn good to us. Here at Canal Flats, the CFI mill is working around the clock on beetle-killed lodgepole pine. There's another one here. You can see it really, really see the blue staining. And uh, it knocks the quality of lumber down. Your lumber grade is, is, uh, is knocked down. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably been dead for three years, probably. You can see the check in here from the weather, dry it out, which also knocks down the lumber quality. It, uh, makes good chips because they don't really grade chips at all yeah but uh, for lumber for lumber that blue stain does knock the grade down people don't like blue lumber
This debarking process gets rid of the beetles, larvae, and eggs. But nothing can be done about that blue stain, which is a kind of fungus brought into the tree on the beetle's back. And that's what kills the tree. That and the hundreds of holes bored by the beetle. We can't go into fresh areas because we've got thousands of acres of, of uh, this beetle kill stuff. 70% of our logging is, is bug salvage right now. And of course, if most of your logging is salvaging pine, well, it may be hard to meet market demands for other species of timber. One of the problems when you, as soon as you spot an infestation in an area like this, is planning your harvesting. Because as you can see, the topography is very steep, road building is expensive, logging is difficult, and it's a question of trying to get in there early enough so you can get the wood out while it is still sound, and hopefully get ahead of the people. <laughs> So we've really only got two choices. Do nothing, or try to salvage the infested and dying trees. And that can mean working in difficult terrain, in unscheduled areas, using hastily improvised access roads that can further damage the environment. Steep mountain valleys, choppers are the fastest way of doing inspection trips. Mike Finnis forester in charge of pest management for the Forest Service. The beetle epidemic and the problems of salvage logging concern him too. Salvage logging requires quick and decisive action, but here in the Elk Creek, White River area, indecision and lack of planning by industry and government has meant thousands of hectares of dead and dying trees, causing not only a serious fire hazard, but also erosion from hurriedly built logging roads. Wildlife has been disturbed, streams blocked or diverted, and of course millions of cubic meters of commercial timber lost. Today everyone knows the answer. Stay ahead of the beetle. You've commenced your resurvey, Kathy. I wonder if you'd also check out Whitetail Lake and Elk Creek. Okay. We can move to Whitetail Lake right away and check out what's happening there. Keeping ahead of the beetle is a bit like plotting the movement of a guerrilla army. Where will it strike next? Here's the air photo for this Elk Creek map. And that pine type's right here. Be the beetle survey crews of the Forest Service have to plan their field trips much like a military operation. An only ground survey on foot, tree by tree can pinpoint the new areas of infestation. It's like, it's and that means a long walk in the forest. I think maybe we should do a line in there. Eh? Yeah, I think there's possibly two years attack here. Looks like it. Red trees are dead like trees. Far, and new generations of beetles move on to attack mature green trees. The the Yet the beetle's only doing what I comes naturally. Old, but he probably didn't get in far. There's no attack this year either. You can't see any sawdust on the tree. Anywhere. 
course, they still could be flying. They'll still be flying, so they'll still be suspect. Seeing large-scale outbreaks, most of us want to know why the trees are killed. Federal Forest Service entomologist Les Safranek. A simple answer to that question, of course, is that the beetles utilize parts of the trees for their food. Now, the beetles carry in special structures in their mouth part blue stain fungi, which are also smeared all over their body. These fungi are released as they start constructing the galleries in the inner bark. The fungi will quickly start growing and penetrating the living tissues of the tree, thereby killing it. We determined that successfully attacked trees will have died after about uh, two months or so, although the foliage of these trees might uh, look green for up to one year. Right in the middle of this whole uh, catastrophe or epidemic mountain pine beetle attack is this White Swan Lake Park. And uh, the people can visit this park uh, freely, but they're going to be viewing dead trees and red trees for the next 15 to 20 years. And they're going to see a lot of logging activity on the mountainsides and the hillsides and on the flats. So the public's going to have to realize what the uh, situation is up here. No, dead trees don't look very nice. What's worse, dead trees eventually get blown down and become unmanageable debris. And all it takes is just one hot summer to turn the entire area into a tinderbox. Kootenai Patrol 3, Canal Flat, go ahead. We have a small smoke on Fry Creek. Roger, uh, Foxtrot Roma Romeo Yankee. Uh, roger, roger on that. That's affirmative. And those small smokes can turn into big smokes. Trouble is, we're better at fire control than beetle control. Surefire kills the beetles. But it also kills a lot of jobs, too. Letting nature take its course could mean mill closures and local unemployment. So what effective action can be taken against the beetle? The natural predators like woodpeckers and the wasp larva on the left here really don't make much difference. What about insecticides? Yeah. I think they should spray for it, don't you? Well, it doesn't, you can't spray because it burrows deep down in the bark, you see. Oh, so you oh. can't get at it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you don't want it to uh, um, hurt other oh, things, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what, how do you kill them? That's the problem, we don't know yet. You can kill a few of them, but not a lot of them at one time. Would I you still like think you should spray. Well, a team of chemists and entomologists at Simon Fraser University believe they have a solution. What we're doing here at Simon Fraser is attempting to isolate the natural attractants which the beetles use to attract each other. In Dr. The field. John Borden. What happens is the female beetle attacks a tree and produces chemicals when she begins to feed. These chemicals walk through the forest and males um, home in on that to join the females and other females populate the whole tree. Now we think that we can turn these chemicals against the insects and what you see here is um, logs that were collected in the field, infested logs. The beetles are emerging from them just as they would in nature. What will happen to them is that their sex will be determined under the microscope. The females will be allowed to attack logs in the laboratory. After 24 hours we'll remove them from the logs and um, this is kind of gruesome, but their, um, their abdomens will be excised. 
a chemical extract will be made. The chemist then can fractionate this mixture into smaller mixtures. Sooner or later, we get down to a one component mixture, which hopefully will be the same chemicals which the beetles use in nature. After we take the beetles out of the logs, we dissect the abdomens out of the females and we put them into pentane which we then use in a bioassay to determine if it's attractive to the male beetles or not. If they uh, respond positively to it they'll walk towards it otherwise they'll ignore it. Now when we have these synthetic chemicals or pheromones we would use them in one of two ways. We might uh, use a trap coated with something called stickum special. Hundreds of these traps would be deployed through a forest area. The other way would be to bait standing trees which were destined to be logged. The pheromone odor would evaporate from this. The uh, beetles would respond to it thinking they were responding to a female infested tree and be trapped dead. Which beetle extract is this? Uh, this is the steam distilled beetle extract. So this is the... Uh, the Simon Fraser experiment works in the lab. It's still got to be tested on a large scale in the forest. So how many beetles are we going to have to raise to isolate this peak? I would say about 10,000 beetles. That's going to take a while at 100 beetles a day. I can't take care of the bugs in our yard. It just seems they thrive on pesticides. Anybody starts to do to anything, do you've got an environmentalist on your neck and you can't. There are real environmental concerns about salvage logging on a massive scale where you just take an entire valley all at once. Hamish Kimmins, environmentalist for the University of British Columbia. Well, the question is whether we're going to harvest stands like this. The trees are dead or they're dying. We can't do anything about that. It's fait accompli. Do we now leave the stands as they are or do we harvest them? And the question comes down to whether or not the benefits to be obtained from harvesting them outweigh any adverse consequences of undertaking the harvest. There can be a problem, however, from roads. On basic access road, it's not yet in its final condition. It doesn't have adequate drainage or culverts yet, and during periods of high-intensity summer rain, the surface soil becomes very soupy, and it's very subject to removal by meltwaters. There can be quite a problem of erosion. So even though harvesting sites like this may be environmentally all right, as far as soils are concerned, our access roads can still be a problem. A certain degree of soil compaction may not be a bad thing. Soil compaction that occurs when equipment drives over the soil many times or drags heavy logs over it gives the soil a slightly greater ability to hold on to that spring moisture and may even result in, in slightly better regeneration of trees. Some places in the southern interior you get your thickest regeneration on your skid roads. Doug has mentioned before that there's a... Representatives of industry, wildlife and forest service make on-the-spot decisions about how and where to log. In our preliminary assessment, Doug, what we've proposed is to log down to the creek. Maybe Ken could just explain the type of machinery you're going to use no. down there. You remember a field trip out there, Ross, and I pointed out to you the importance of that area is for elk and deer movement. And uh, you already know the fisheries values of that stream. If you no. go and do some clear-cut logging on the edge of that creek, you're going to totally impair that site. We have agreed to a fairly significant corridor over both sides of the creek lower down here. And what we're afraid of is that we get into this corridor situation along everything. We know it's uh, almost pure pine down here. What, what do we have left? What, what value is that corridor? Is it uh, dead standing pine? Any value really to you as a corridor? Well, we've uh, got nothing left, but on, on this site here, you could, if you didn't log this area up here down to the creek, took this area in here, and we could live with that. Yeah, okay, so if we leave a, a reserve down this side of the creek and then uh, then take some selective logging here, leave part of the stand in here. Yeah, we could live with that. That'd work well, okay. Well, what, a, what about a, rather than a full reserve, we, we have a, a equipment reserve. In other words, no equipment within a certain distance of the creek edge so we don't get any compaction or disturbance of the soil and then allow uh, selected hand falling out of that corridor and lining it out. Because the train right here lends itself to it. We aren't dealing with any side slopes, and here it's relatively flat all the way up along mm -hmm. here.
good salvage logging means clear cutting when you've only got one species of tree in an area, such as the lodgepole pine. With other species of trees alongside the pine, then you do selective logging, leaving the healthy trees to regenerate. But ecological considerations have to be weighed against emergency needs. In the Elk Creek White River area, they're making up for lost time with salvage logging on a massive scale. What else can they do? The beetles have taken over, the woods have become a battleground. But here in the Flathead and Alcamina Kishinina region in the southeast Kootenays, planning and prompt salvage logging have kept the area in better shape with less environmental damage. Of course, we could just leave the trees, let nature take its course. Or maybe science will solve the problem. Maybe. In the meantime, what we're doing in the East Kootenays is to make the best of a bad situation. Salvage the wood, maintain employment, and preserve the parks and wildlife habitat. But to do nothing now is to condemn our forest resources to a slow death.